Hello, welcome back. In the last episode, part three on financial inclusion and fintech, we discussed about the solution, whether it should be digital identity or digital cash. Now, I think there is an ongoing concern about account takeover and abuse of uh, using digital identity or documents. Um, as we can see it lately, we read a lot about people selling their ID credentials to bad actors to be used to open bank accounts to launder ill-gotten gains. I know it's happening in Singapore. And uh, there were interviews with uh, all these uh, who have been caught, asking them why did they do it. The answer was they needed money. So I think, you know, when it comes to uh, digital identity, uh, it could be a double-edged sword. What do you think? I think digital identity is an extraordinarily large and complicated subject that brings in technology and a lot of areas that um, are frankly too big for a 15 minute episode today. Um, and I think we can park that a little bit and look at the problem that digital identity is supposed to solve, but doesn't. The idea is that if there is a digital identity, then everyone can say, yes, you are who, who you say you are, and therefore it is safe to deal with you. That's trying to solve a problem which, as Des drew attention to before, of trust. How do we trust the person that comes up to us and says, I want to open an account? And this ties into the financial exclusion rather than financial inclusion, when we start to look at people that do not have the appropriate identity documents for one reason or another. Are we going to say we are going to give an account to absolutely everybody, regardless of who they are, um, and then we'll find out who they are and deal with them and adjust the, the, the type of account they're entitled to, rather like we do with mobile phones, um, where anyone can get a pay-as-you-go phone, but then they have to register it um, appropriately um, soon afterwards. And many fintechs are allowing um, very well, yeah, a lot, a lot of fintechs that are that are looking to democratize the um, access to financial services are allowing very low value um, electronic accounts effectively, which are in accordance with the idea, which is not very different to the octopus card or the oyster card or the um, and, and the, the small accounts that are allowed under the electronic money directives and things like that. So we can both legally and practically give an account to literally anybody that walks through the door we just have to limit what can happen on that account and if we make those de minimis levels low enough and if we're talking about the people who are really at the bottom of the heap that's only got to have the equivalent of a 50 pounds 75 dollar um 75 us dollar um balance to be able to allow them to function on a day-to-day -day basis so we can do that but then that's not going to be enough for people once they start to sort themselves out so identity and trusting that person is going to be the primary challenge i don't think it's impossible but i think it does require a different approach to that which has so far been adopted does I agree with a different approach because uh, again goes back to a question that I that I ask again I like asking questions even though I don't have uh, definitive answers is uh, to be perfectly honest why has fintech failed the unbanked because it, we don't seem to have got anywhere different to where we were maybe 5 years ago or 10 years ago when everybody was starting to talk about uh, providing services for the underbanked or, or whatever. And, and the big word that runs through my feeling, and I think that where we started off this morning was um, that word trust. Trust in a relationship goes both ways. And there's the trust that the data that is being used to collect the digital identities for uh, an individual who may not have all the correct things, uh, correct information, is they're, they're trusting you not to abuse it. I know Julia's talked about people selling it because they need the money and whatever. Um, 
that there are businesses out there what what the fintechs have got to do is to gain the trust and what we have is um almost the reverse financial inclusion process here because of the reluctance of the individuals uh, or their inability to be able to provide that uh, identity and the lack of trust that they have in what's going in in that business uh, again i could i could talk for 20 minutes on this um but uh, I'll pass that over for the moment, just on that thought. And again, I'm only asking questions, not providing answers. Mark? So this is how I understand it, that uh, perhaps we, sh I think we we would need to evolve beyond rigid checkboxes and embrace a more adaptable methods to be able to accommodate the nuances of each situation. Um, to me, one thing that brought to mind was a friend of mine who is a nationality who is a national of a sanctioned country and he had difficulty getting a bank account so these are some of the concerns that i feel that you know check boxes would not work i know i i i have the same kind of um experience uh, a, 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 a co-worker stroke friend of mine uh He's, he comes from a um, sanctioned country. He's made a lot of money in the 10, 12 years that he's been in uh, UK um, in uh, crypto business. But the bank decided that they didn't want him because his original place of birth was a sanctioned country, even though he has UK residency. So again, that trust, how far does it go and whatever. But it's not only the banks that cause this. There are many countries which, excuse me, many countries which require quite big hurdles to be able to open a bank account. And this is a central bank question. It's not a fintech or a bank question. So they, the, someone who has PR would be entitled to. But someone who's lived in a country for a long time is not entitled to get a bank account unless certain uh, certain very difficult conditions are met. Someone who has a someone who has a work permit could get a could get a, a bank account. But it's by no means certain how, for example, digital nomads are going to be able to get bank accounts. Now, this is somewhere where fintechs can help because their requirements are in many ways slacker than um, than for a proper bank so it is possible to do that but the idea of using somebody else's bank account for good or ill I mean, apart from being a, um, a problem under the money laundering laws um, the the idea of using somebody else's bank account is absolutely crucial to many people around the world um, and i mean whole families share one bank account in in some places and if you look at the issue of the Mexican migrants, migrant workers in the USA, they often have a bank account for their own domestic use, but then they have another bank account with a card attached to it, which is used by their family in Mexico. So the, the, the American bank account is not for the benefit of the person in America who has the, who holds the account. It's for the benefit of, of somebody overseas. FinTech brought out the, uh, what I call the parent child type of, uh, cards where the adult could uh, could sign up and it was their son or daughter that they were given the card who were under 16 so maybe we could expand that parent child relationship into um, the uh, trust and ID side of the business I mean certainly for me I think you 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 talked about the money laundering regulations yes definitely regulations and have, and have not are not helping um, the enabling of full digital financial inclusion at the moment. I, so how I see Mark is dying to. I see Mark is dying to say something. <laughs> I, will, I, I just want to put a few cats among the pigeons here with with a, a little thought. Um, how lazy are banks? If they don't want to do something. They'll go, oh, you're from a sanctioned country, 
I need to go no further. We'll open an account. Fintechs. We are not banks, but we are really because we're here to enable you and to give you some kind of uh, access to financial systems as long as you can identify yourselves in accordance with the regulations as set out by the central bank. What do you mean nobody is coming to us? We Financial exclusion is real and is occurring every day and to my mind is not improving at the rate we were led to expect when the fintechs embarked on this this journey into widening access to financial systems and it keeps coming down to the same issue which is the one that we've been discussing which is trust the trouble is i think it goes both ways i don't think a lot of poor uh, uh, and disadvantaged people trust the institutions and i'm sure as hell willing to bet nigel's last tea bag that the governments don't trust their own people and this is the problem and i'm not able to give you an answer except you're going to need some very good people to manage the systems who are going to have to be trained who are going to have to be encouraged to exercise professional judgment excuse the squeaky chair there and at that point i'll hand over to des before i start ranting for 10 minutes straight oh, I'd, I'd, I'd love you to rant for 10 minutes straight i i agree with a lot of what you've said um there, there, there's two things uh, you, you kind of mentioned there and, and a phrase that I often use is who polices the police who do we trust to do this that's the biggest problem um, and that that's probably a huge social problem and it's a financial regulation problem but uh, it goes over there one of the phrases and I think it's probably an American phrase that I've heard about uh, fintechs are the fintechs you, you said we're not banks but we can offer banking services and we provide the bridges, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, again, the question, or question that I would ask is, uh, are the fintechs the equivalent of di digital lipstick? It's only putting something on there that just doesn't make sense. What do you think? <laughs> uh, the idea of lipstick on a pig appeals to me greatly. Uh, I think yeah. that what, one of the things that, to answer Mark's question, why are fintechs not delivering this the answer is that poor people are expensive um, and they are as we said in episode one if that, that, that if you're going to get this type if you're going to get services down to the very poor it cannot be done from a company that is expecting to make a profit and fintech companies have shareholders and those shareholders expect profits and the yeah. idea of saying you have to give a free bank account to absolutely everybody might work if there's only one fintech but it doesn't work when there's a competitive environment because they're all going to say it's somebody else's problem and to be fair there's no reason why they shouldn't well most of the third party providers that the fintechs use are profit seeking businesses themselves which means exactly. there's a cost involved everywhere even if you're trying to do something that's helping the social uh, the underbanked or the unbanked there's no one so, thing fits all i think so here do we have a conclusion in our last one minute of this julia yep i think that uh, i would say that you know there is a lot of food for thought as far as risk-based approach is concerned and there is no one size fit all and there is no silver bullet to the situation that we are in today um, whether or not fintech could be the answer to financial inclusion and i say that in the last four episodes including today uh, discussing about fintech's contribution to financial inclusion here are even more questions than answers do products well, need what, to be we will do, we will do one program with you setting out all those questions and what, what answers you think you've got okay <laughs> okay cool so, thank you very much Julia. thank you